Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Hawthorne and I'm really excited to moderate what is going to be a fascinating discussion between Tavit Janssen, Raivo Kilomez and Lena Kavalik uh, about the present and future of digital theatre. This panel draws on a brilliant article on the topic written by Raivo, Tavit and their colleague Petri Hoppu as part of the ongoing ACUTE programme, which is a pioneering digital theatre project across Europe with ECA as one of its partner organizations funded by the Creative Europe Programme. You can access the article via the event page for this panel or in the description for this video. If you haven't already, I highly recommend reading it after we finish here today. It presents the history of technological interventions in the theatre, but also points towards some of the most urgent questions concerning digitality and the theatre in the future. How might increasingly powerful digital technologies fundamentally shape what theatre is, how we make it, watch it, participate in it, and what terminologies do we need to describe these changes in form, content, artists, and industry? For this first part of the panel, each of us will give a short introduction to our work in this field, as well as our own hopes, ideas, maybe even fears concerning the rapidly changing nature of digitally enabled theatre and performance. And after that, we'll open up the floor to discussion. We invite any questions or thoughts that you might have, uh, inclusive of the audience watching us today via live stream. I'll be keeping an eye out for any comments. And we'll also respond to each other's presentations as well. So with the housekeeping out of the way, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do, and my own research approach to the present and future of digital theatre. So, as I said, my name is Katie, and I'm a researcher living in Edinburgh in Scotland. I received my PhD from the University of Edinburgh in 2022, with a thesis focused on the changing state and status of what we call liveness in the theatre, in relation to increasingly established digital technologies. Besides my own research, I work for the Academy for Theatre and Digitality in Dortmund, and my role there is to facilitate knowledge sharing. We launched our new research platform, Portal, last autumn, which you can find at portal.theater.digital. I'll put a link up later if you're interested. And there you can find details of every brilliant research project, project ever taken at the Academy. Um, also last year, in collaboration with the Academy and the European Theatre Convention, I authored the first cross-European study into the use of digital tools and technologies in our theatres pre, during and post COVID. I'll talk a little bit more about that study later on and also share the link again if anyone is interested in reading the full thing. Um, my kind of provocation for today, for this theme of the present and future of digital theatre, centres upon liveness, as you can see. Um, often we hear that theatre is a live art form and that liveness is the key characteristic of the theatre as a performing art. But what is liveness? The answer to this has changed over the history of theatre in concert with evolving modes of performance. But I argue that never has liveness been more pertinent to the theatre industry and the field of theatre and performance studies than in the 21st century. There is still actually no definitive scholarly consensus on what liveness is exactly, but the term is often used as if it is self-explanatory, with the impression that, you know, we know liveness when we see it or when we feel it. For many, a performance is simply live or it is not. But when you start to question this, it all gets a bit more complicated. For instance, is an improvised performance more or less live than a rehearsed production? Or is a performance which exists for one night only more or less live than a performance that runs for 30 years on Broadway? And does a performance feel more live when tickets are sold out and a seat in the auditorium becomes a prized commodity, maybe? But you add digitality into that mix and you get even more questions, such as, is watching a live stream performance from your apartment more or less live than watching that performance inside a theater? Or what about if performers were using a script that was generated by AI in real time? Would that make it feel more or less live of a performance to you? Um, and what if, I, if your own responses to that performance were being measured in real time and used to tailor that performance to your own reactions? How would that feel to you? Um, well, one reason that you might consider an improvised performance to be somehow more live is because for some people, liveness is characterized by risk and the idea that, uh, as scholar Martin Barker puts it, the outcome is not guaranteed. Risk is one of several factors that Barker proposes as established characteristics of liveness in the theater, alongside co-presence, that the performer and the audience are both there, simultaneity, that the performance is happening at that very moment, and audience impact, the idea that audience reactions might affect how the event goes. 
He also lists other factors of liveness that are more pertinent to other art forms, such as the value of like a local joke to a stand-up comedian. Um, but this delineation of liveness along the lines of art form and genre does ring largely true for me. And in this way, Barker is implying that liveness is rooted in societal expectations and traditions and rituals, and that it isn't an ontological state rather than a performance simply being live, or it isn't. Liveness can manifest differently according to the cultural context that it sits in. But so far, none of this is specific to digital forms of theatre. This is all true for any form of performance, you could say. But digitality has a special relationship to liveness, and there are many people who hold the opinion that digital technologies and media can disrupt or even damage the liveness of that perf performance. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I took that bit out earlier. <laughs> okay. So... Oh, sorry, I've got a technical... Here we go, we're back. So as I said, so far none of this is specific to digital forms of theatre. Um, but yeah, theatre and liveness has this kind of challenging relationship to digitality for some people. And for instance, I, my research on the European Theatre Convention's digital theatre study found that many theatres believe digitality to be the opposite of liveness, even if they use many technologies in the creation of their work. What's more, the wave of digital live streams necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which I'm sure we all remember, seems to have reinforced that opinion that digital forms of theatre are for when quote-unquote real theatre is dead. Um, and this oppositional relationship between liveness and digitality, and even liveness and simply technology, has historical precedent, much of which I don't have time to tell you about in the next five minutes, unfortunately. Um, and I would encourage you to read this study if you have time or interest, and I put a link at the end of uh, this talk if you're interested in more of that context. Um, but one very famous example of this kind of oppositional relationship to liveness and technology is in Peggy Phelan's 1993 definition of live performance, which has become deeply influential. So she asserted that performance's only life is in the present. Performance cannot be saved, recorded, documented, or otherwise participate in the circulation of representations of representations. So her definition of live performance is determined really by what it isn't. And for Phelan, live performance is not mediatized. For feeling media can challenge the present moment of the performance, and this takes away its supposedly inherent sense of liveness. And I think this idea really underpins much of the anxiety that we still see around theatre and digitality today, that theatre's traditional type of liveness is at risk of being damaged or even destroyed by technology. For me, I argue the opposite, that liveness is contextual and that it changes alongside the evolution of new theatrical forms. And this is akin to Philip Auslander's famous response to Phelan, first published in 1999. He argues that all live performance is constantly changing in response to technological innovations. And as such, the meaning of liveness should be understood as historical and contingent. So he argues that liveness is crystallized as an identif identifiable experience alongside the rise of recording and distributive technologies. That the idea of going to a concert didn't become so crystallized until you could also get that concert at home on a recording. And I guess for me, the, that relationship between what we understand to be liveness and the evolution of new technologies is how I see it, but we have come a long way technologically since the 90s, and those kinds of questions that we're facing have become quite different. So yes, they to still have concerns regarding the true liveness of a live stream versus an in-performance, in-person performance, but we're facing seismological, technological shifts which have the power to change much, much more than that. So what will liveness mean in the face of rising automation, for instance? And while certain technologies might give audiences new ways to interact with a production, what other connotations do those technologies have in terms of data privacy or ownership or surveillance or intellectual property? And those are really big questions. So I want to finish with a short example of a recent project from the Academy for Theatre and Digitality. This is Keep It Real by Pete Esch, which is a fresh exploration of what we might call hologram theatre, but it's also a really eloquent challenge of what we can call live theatre even in 2024. So these look like two production photographs from kind of two normal theatrical productions, right? Possibly even a split screen live stream showing two different scenes at once. In actuality, those stages are intricate, miniaturized models. The left is a perfectly scaled down model of Theatre Dortmund's main stage. 
and the right is of Hebel am Ufer in Berlin. And those two actors that we just saw here and here are um, performing simultaneously from different cities, performing live, if you will, and they are being projected as holograms onto these miniaturized stages. So in January, Esch set up these two models, which again you can see on either side of the scaffolding. He set them up to face each other and invited the audience to stand in the space between the two. It looked like this. How often do you get to stand as if a giant between two miniaturized uh, theater houses? Not so often. Um, but in some ways, the hologram part is the simplest element of the whole thing. Using a trick of projection akin to the Victorian theatrical technique Pepper's Ghost, a live video of each actor, actor is projected onto a glass screen placed, placed at a 45 degree angle in front of each model. So you can see that here. Sorry, it's a really bad picture. I took that one, which is why it's considerably worse than the others. But you can see that glass panel kind of sliding in front of it. Um, so this reflects the image, making it appear as if the actor is standing on that stage. And as you can see, if you stand too far to the side, the actor will disappear from sight or be kind of sliced in half. Um, but what is far less simple is the technological setup required for the actors to perform together in this way, simultaneously from different cities. They need to be able to hear each other so that they can respond to and perform in dialogue with each other. They also need to be able to communicate with Esh, who sits at that kind of mission control desk in the middle. But really, the most special part for me was that at the end of the performance, it becomes apparent that the actors can also hear our applause as we clap, they talk back to us, they bow, they wave, and it feels really uncanny. There's a really like a distancing effect at work here as the tiny scale deliberately challenges your perception of the actors as real and live performers, but they are actually performing there in real time for me. So to me, this is quite a brilliant example of how we don't even necessarily recognize live performance anymore when we see it. Although much of this work is live in actually quite a traditional way, there's a stage to actors and an audience gathered in front of them simultaneously in co-presence using a lot of those kind of traditional characteristics that we spoke about earlier. So really the main challenge to that traditional notion of liveness here is in that physical distance between the actors and their stage and the actors and their audience, but not vice versa. It's a fun, kind of extraordinary, really, magic trick of technology and an ambitious new form of performance, but also in many ways a highly traditional performance of theatrical liveness. So to wrap up my part, uh, I propose that liveness in the theatre will continue to resist simple definition because its meaning will continue to expand in concert with the unstoppable evolution of theatre and performance as an art form. Live theatre will continue to remake itself just like it always has. But I want to finish by asking, what does liveness mean to you? And do you see certain digital technologies as a challenge to it? I look forward to discussing that later and thank you for listening. And now I will hand over to Tavit. Hello, thank you, Katie. Um, I will also uh, mention, I think, uh, some of the same texts, and uh, what Martin Peck and uh, maybe Philip Auslander a bit. <coughs> I am uh, Tavet Janssen, and I'm a PhD su student here in ECHO, and I'm working on the digital theatre, let's say. And uh, I'm a researcher and an artist, artistic researcher. And I will present my thoughts of hybrid stages and crafting theatrical experiences in the digital age. I've been combining digital art and theatre for 18 years. In that time, not much has changed. The experiments have higher quality and there are some more possibilities available, but for the most part, the relationship between theatre and new technology is the same. I have changed a bit. I used to work with sensor technology and interactive video on stage, but now I work with staging theatre somewhere between digital and physical worlds. 
Some call the state pugital. I don't like that expression. I like I'm on the border between light and shadow. When I talk to someone from the tech industry about the digital theater, they don't understand why theater. When I speak to theater people, they don't understand why digital technology. There is us together here and now. But I keep experimenting with how digital technologies can connect performers and audiences and finally free the theater from the space it is chained to, whether it wants it or not. There's no great name for partly digital and physic partly physical theater. Is it online theater? Is it streamed theater or a digital mediated live event or walk theater in Estonian? Or, and where is a digital theater happening anyway? Is it in a studio with performers or on a website with a video streaming window or in your room where you watch the website with a video streaming window? Lev Manovich says that a computer monitor connected to a network lets us be present in a place thousands of miles away. I think the key is the feeling that we are together during the art event. But how can you be present if you don't know where the performance is happening? Kay McCauley has discussed uh, classifying different types of spaces in theatre. For me, the most interesting space in his, in his taxonomy is a fictional space. In theatre, there is a stage space, followed by the presentational space, which basically is a stage space with a set design. This presentational space with the actors and the performance brings the audience and the performers together in a fictional space. I also like to call it an imaginary space. But I argue that this imaginary space can also be created in online theater. We must use digital tools to create a constellation of impulses that will activate the viewer's imagination similarly to the theatrical experience. The idea of performers and audience being in the same space simultaneously while meeting in this fictional space makes theater unique. But it's not just about being physically together. It is also about feeling each other. And this feeling of togetherness is much harder to create in online fiat. It may be easier for the spectators. They can see it in the chat window, how many people are chatting, or see the number of visitors in the corner of a window. But for the performer, it's much harder to create the sense that there is actual people on the other side of a camera and they are not playing in the void. In theatre, the audience's reactions, laughter, applause, are essential parts of the interaction between the actor and the audience. People's reactions are spontaneous and immediate. But in online theatre, people sit behind their computers and don't want to do anything. They have to be persuaded to participate in the performance. And we've used audience interaction to boost audience's engagement and also to create a sense of core presence for the performers. There aren't any established systems for using audience interaction in online performances. I'm talking about old school online theater, where you stream the performance camera feed to a website. Together with Electron Art, we've been developing custom interaction tools for our performances, such as sliders and buttons, to monitor the audience's reactions in real time. We analyze and organize this information and use it in our performances. I don't mean using the audience's collective decision-making for let decide what happens next type of interaction. I think the audience, should have, audience shouldn't have this kind of power. Our interest is in creating an atmosphere where the performers and viewers are creating this performance together. In Project Memento, we looked for ways to make audience interaction an organic part of a performance. It was a hybrid performance. Some of the audience was physical, some virtual. The virtual audience could interact with a performance by making collective decisions. At certain moments, the audience could choose whether the energy of a performance should go up, down, or stay the same. 
by choosing between three buttons. One had an arrow up, one second had an arrow down, and the third one had a small heart. However, the decisions made by the viewers didn't automatically affect the performance. During the performance, a person between the performers and the audience reacted to the viewers' decisions. She selected a music piece and adjusted the lightning based on the audience's choices. As a result, the whole atmosphere in the performance changed in response to the audience's decision. However, the viewers only had the power to choose the direction of a change, not what exactly would change. But it didn't matter because the performance was a structured improvisation, so nobody knew what would happen next anyway. But because of the change in the atmosphere, the actors also got to know that there is an audience who was deciding something, which helped them to feel that online people were watching them. And this kind of interaction, which is organically built into the performance, can also increase audiences' engagement if, they, if that's what they want. Those who wish to be fully immersed in the control can choose to do so, while others can simply watch without interacting. Everything is fine. In the case of Memento, 92% of viewers participated in this interaction. Of course, this solution assumed that the participants could improvise. In Memento, everyone was involved in improvisation. Back in backstage, we had to decide on the fly how, to, uh, how the performance should continue, when to activate the buttons, and be ready to select a piece of music at the moment's notice. It meant being 100% present all the time, reading what was happening on stage, following what was happening online, and calculating in our heads what might happen next. What is this person's role? What skills are needed? Online performances have created a need for a new breed of creative technical roles. There isn't even a proper job title for this person who navigates between the digital and the physical. I call them cyberconductors or digital shamans. The Future Stage Manifesto proposes the whole series of jobs, such as waiting room hypester or screenographer. But the truth is that uh, the kind of person who manages the live performers and the digital stage at the same time has a new profession. I, d I think that this type of person could be called a live director. When I started working with theatre and digital technology, the theatre had a strong position of power. Now the balance of power has changed. Our lives exist in both digital and physical domains and we constantly navigate between, between the two. They say that computer technology is going through a fourth big change. The first was in the 70s when we could interact with a computer using text. The 80s saw the introduction of a UI. The third was in 2007 when uh, uh, the iPhone came along and introduced us the touch screens. The fourth is wearable computing. It seems that XR is now making a breakthrough, underpinned by the revolutionary activation of AI. I'm no longer asking how to bring technology into fiat. I'm asking that what can we take from fiat to make digital live entertainment more engaging and exciting. We live as if we live forever, as if we will always be healthy and there will be never a catastrophe. But in reality, is that we are surrounded by wars, climate change and migration crises. Many of us have special needs. We must look for ways to increase inclusion opportunities so that being physically present is not the only option. If XR and AI technolo technologies develop as predicted, then perhaps soon most of our art will be also virtually accessible and our physical location won't matter anymore. Thank you. I'm Tavet. And uh, thanks for listening. And I'll hand over to Raivo Kelomes.
Hello, <clears throat> my name is Raivo Kilomis. I'm a researcher here at Academy of Arts. And uh, I would like to present you a very simple term, third space, uh, what I took from one document, which was exploring telepresent, telepresence stage. And uh, here is the mm, quote I would like to present to you the future of theater as a hybrid of the physical stage and the virtual environment, breaking down the boundaries between the local and the remote to create the theater of the third space. Uh, to explain it very easy, the third space is sort of participants in one location plus participants in another location. They are put together in on screen where they see each other and behave towards each other dependent of, from the image what they see. But I would like to mm, remind you uh, through some examples or bring to you three categories of examples uh, and show that this so-called third space we can say existed already earlier in uh, participatory artworks and in uh, telecommunication artworks as well. And now, naturally, we are encountering them in various form of uh, telepresence uh, performances. Uh, first, uh, participatory artworks and audience behavior. Uh, already in kinetic art, uh, participants did something and um, brought in life situations which didn't exist before their behavior. So behavior plus uh, physical uh, object or physical artifacts of the artworks uh, no, made so-called kind of, we can, we can even say hybrid um, space or third space. Um, in the works of uh, Jean Tangli, the audience was doing something, uh, Paul Talman, also, those balls were for turning and uh, um, making your own image uh, from them. Or uh, Namjoon Pike's random access music, where audience was using the sounds, um, head, um, and uh, making the sound environment uh, themselves. On the right, there is a reconstruction of that work in 2009. Uh, research group. Uh, from Paris in uh, the 60s did several uh, performances in the city where also the, the people's behavior kind of changed their own behavior and changed space as well uh, around them. And naturally we can talk about interactive art where this uh, collaboration with this physical entity of the artwork is uh, essential, is very important. Uh, without uh, the audience behavior nothing is happening and here the audience should bend his on this chair of this uh, Jeffrey Shaw uh, work or uh, walk around this um, uh, postament where this invisible uh, golden calf is depicted or uh, to play with the, the, his own image which is emerging in real time in Chris uh, Milk um, uh, artwork. Uh, and uh, naturally, Krista Sommer and Lauren Minano works are rich of this uh, kind of examples. I'm bringing just one here, um, uh, where your behavior plus this digital addition, uh, they are making some third kind of environment, a random international. Uh, some works by Estonian artist uh, Johan Sommets, uh, artist room where people's behavior made uh, the sound environment happen, or Reimo uh, Tanks on democracy, where at least two participants were doing something to make this light uh, behind democracy uh, panel um, working. Uh, so uh, at least uh, behavior or participation, at least two um, persons where was not required for this kind of work. Another group of examples shared space in the telecommunication artworks. 
uh, we can say there is a long history of uh, this kind of um, uh, performances and uh, works where uh, um, performers' images are superimposed uh, on the screen. They see each other um, being, in fact, in different locations, like here in Kit Galloway and Cheri Rabinovich's work, very famous project, where here on the left, uh, from the left images, people are in different locations. They are not together in that uh, space. And those times, naturally, in the 70s and 80s, it was almost like a miracle to arrange such uh, performances or meetings of uh, performer, performers and dancers. Um, and um, uh, this um, project um, 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 came down to history as well uh, as um, uh, very important, where people found uh, uh, themselves talking to each other, uh, being, in fact, in New York or Lo uh, Los Angeles. And um, um, my favorite example, Paul Sherman, British artist, who have done um, like last 30 or even more years uh, different telematic um, performances or installations, and one uh, um, very famous one, Telematic Dreaming, where you are sort of meeting another person on your bed and uh, interacting with him, her, uh, and there are several vari variations of this work. Uh, plus uh, variations in different settings where people are sitting on different uh, couches and see each other on the screen and uh, behave uh, towards each other. And this is, we can call it kind of third space where they are finding themselves, um, being uh, put together on screen, in fact, located in different rooms or different cities even. And uh, variations, there are several variations for uh, the same structure where you are playing, where you, where you have much more kind of elements to play with. You're raising some parts of your body or parts of, of the environment. And um, uh, so, but uh, all these examples are very important to come finally uh, to experiments uh, in so-called present stage um, paradigm, or, or which was in fact a project initiated by the way um, by the same Paul Sermon and uh, Steve Dixon um, in the context of uh, pandemic uh, we had recently to allow um, uh, actors or theater professionals to meet together or to rehearse together. Uh, using this kind of uh, green screen setting, where um, various games were initiated, uh, a lot of uh, this material is available online if you are interested. Uh, cinematic guarantee, and there were several titles of this um, uh, setting or, or this concept. And uh, this um, you know, expertise was offered to several theaters who arranged their own um, games or their own concepts or their own kind of uh, uh, mini performances where they are using uh, original painting, like the Cezanne painting, for instance, by Creation Theater, mm, or uh, dancing experiments, or where they wanted to, to experiment with holes. Um, and additionally, finally, I would like to present a few examples from uh, Estonian practices, which are not exactly connected with the theater practices. But Tavet already um, uh, was uh, showing his work, and practically Tavet is um, a good uh, living example of that um, hybrid space or even third uh, space practices here in Estonia. But I would like to remind you, uh, Timo Tots and his work, Media Bubble, which has done uh, already 15 years ago, where uh, textual information around this performer is emerging because of movement of this per per performer, uh, which comes from the internet. And uh, again, Timo Tots, uh, famous uh, memo board, which was shown um, in various uh, places and got um, a major prize at Ars Electronica and uh, Barbara and Bar. Uh, speed of markets. They have uh, various works which are retrieving in real time uh, online information and playing with it. So, thank you very much.
Thank you. So my name is Lina Kevelik and I am a stage designer um, and I am uh, very fond of uh, all kinds of optical uh, devices and, um, and theatre technology, historically. So I'm going to jump a bit uh, further into history than the others have done. And um, I try to concentrate on projected images. Well, uh, there's nothing new about uh, projecting images as such, because it's been going on for ages. These lanterns of fear, as they were called, come from the Middle Ages. Uh, further on, they, of course, they became more elaborate. Um, and what is interesting about the magic lanterns is that they all have been uh, invented by physicists, not artists. And actually, the physicists were kind of ashamed of, uh, of dealing with uh, playful stuff like that. And uh, the inventor of the magic lantern actually did not want to talk about it. Um, these, these glass plates uh, with the painted imagery uh, got really complicated. This is one where the image can actually turn. And this, uh, this all is going on in the um, 17th century. Now, this is 18th century, well, uh, where people start projecting on smoke, which uh, in a way becomes this imaginary place or this the third space that you were speaking about. Uh, and it's mostly used to scare people. Uh, they even added uh, some bad smell to bad spirits and good smell for good spirits. Uh, and a guy called Robertson, that's, that's his uh, stage name, actually, he also was a physicist and also a balloonist, uh, but he uh, got his career completely destroyed because he became famous as a showman. And he, uh, as you see in the end of the 18th century, doing rear projections. Um, this is a phantasmagoria device he invented that was a kind of a projector uh, that r rode around on wheels and uh, he basically could put not only glass plates uh, but also other moving stuff like skeletons inside it, the machine and go around scaring people. So um, yeah, this is uh, one of his phantasmagoria shows. And so I'm jumping forward to um, the Paris Expo 1900. Um, that is one of the most famous uh, uh, yeah, for shows, which was called Cinerama. And it's, it's actually, um, it looks quite a lot like our showrooms where they show us Klimt and uh, Chagall paintings with 40 cameras. Here we have uh, 10 cameras, uh, not, sorry, not cameras, projectors. 10 projectors uh, projecting images all around so that the audience who is sitting in the basket of the hot air balloon have the impression of going up about the town and coming down and so on. So. But as for theater, uh, as soon as the, the cinema, the movie camera was invented, in fact, projections uh, were in a lot of shows already. So this, there's nothing new about projecting imagery in the performances either. So um, they were usually uh, um, used to create explosions or show phantoms like in the old days or just to show a part of the action that was in a faraway country or uh, in a space that was hard to depict on the stage. And apparently in the 1920s, in fact, every decent uh, middle-class family in Paris had a projector at home, so had a sort of a home cinema. Uh, and they, you can read that actually the audience got quite bored of screens in the theatre, a little bit like us today, because, uh, well, as you already probably know, there's been a lot and a lot <coughs> and a lot of screens, 
uh, people starting from the Czech la Laterna Magica uh, inventions to nowadays where you can hop on and hop off the screens and so on. So, um, yeah, but in the 20s, people were mostly critical about actors playing very badly as soon as they got on the screen. It was the silent uh, film time, that's why, probably. Nowadays, the actors have definitely overcome this problem, but we, we, I think we still need a good reason to have screens on stage. The most important question for me, in fact, is uh, how to produce poetry. Um, and that's why I, I started also by what the title saying, are we doing amusing physics? Or are we, uh, are we just using these devices to, to create poetry? So is the, is the technology there to shock the audience with its technological novelty, or is it there to produce a poetical effect? It's extremely interesting to look at that question throughout history. Uh, of course, like I said, once they were there to scare the audience, then they had um, yeah, the, these places that were not easy to depict on stage. And the third purpose of inventing technological tricks is obviously to shock the audience with beauty or sudden scene changes. Uh, there was a, a f very weird thing uh, in the end of the 19th century where they did um, science theatre. Henri Robin, for instance, in France was very famous for that. Um, he pretended to be a physicist, uh, but he wasn't. And this uh, sort of a performance also uh, comprised revealing tricks in the name of science. So even the phantoms and the apparitions of phantoms were explained on the stage. But that's an, uh, a problem of illusionism and magic as such, because in the real theater and poetic theater, nobody really wants to know how it's been done. But like uh, that, that kind of physics um, uh, is presented then you always want to know, well, in magic shows, you also, also want to know how it's done. Now, it's the most interesting um, thing uh, to see how physics and stage arts in all of these practices have been merging. It's a well-known fact that uh, as soon as the physicists come to the problem of the black hole, uh, they become poets or philosophers because, because imagination has to take over. And that's why I, I was trying to, to draw a sort of a scheme, uh, how I see also tricks and poetry um, being produced on stage. So yeah, physics and poetry are seemingly different, but they meet at one point. So uh, where are the poetical uses, or w which are the poetical uses of projections? Uh, the first thing from the history that comes to my mind is Meliès's uh, moon, where you can even actually see a metaphor, because it's, uh, it can be read as a new technology attacking the good old world, <laughs> if you wish. I have written my thesis about visual metaphors, and actually, as I'm pr persuaded that uh, metaphorical thinking is really the key to all kind of a creation, um, I've even tried to teach it to machines. And I called, this, this was a, a performance uh, where AI wrote the text uh, according to Chekhov. He had learned to write like Chekhov. And I called it sentimental education for robots. Here you see some characters and citations. And it wasn't a, a comedy at all, because the lamp, for instance, committed suicide. Um, that's one of my favorite citations. Right? And the characters themselves also became kind of metaphors of our internet of things, like the, the talking ovens that we have at home and so on. And that's one of the, um, the uh, examples of metaphors that they, have, they produced for the show. Uh, 
let's go see some good examples. It's not about projections, but I just uh, um, wanted to show some uh, art pieces of art that really um, merge ideally technology and well, where, uh, and the poetical idea. Uh, Sun Yuan and Peng Yu, a, a robot very politely cleaning up blood. <coughs> Dimut Strebe, the prayer, it's robot mouth chanting different prayers. My favorite dancer, French dancer Philippe Priasso, dancing with an excavator. It's all done th to a very um, tender opera music. And now coming back to projections, I, I'm totally honest, if I thought about uh, really good and poetical projections that I've seen in, uh, on stage, then the only thing that came to my mind was Castellucci, Romeo Castellucci, uh, who actually never projects real imagery, but only words. And it's a bit of, it may be a bit cynical to end up with this, but uh, because it's actually projection reduced to its minimum. But uh, yeah, this is Mozart's Requiem, as directed by Castellucci, and uh, where he just um, projected words or titles of lost pieces of art. And this is for me real visual poetry, and there's no sense asking how it's done, because the game is on a totally another level. Uh, it's, let's say, after the black hole of, uh, on top of knowledge, and it's pure poetry. And as for the future, once we know what's behind the black hole, the whole system is going to shift, of course. But yeah, I, I still think that uh, the main reason of using whatever technologies would be to produce poetics. Thank you. part of this panel uh, in just a second. Right, I have your mic. Nice. Are we comfy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was so interesting. It was so great to watch your presentations. Thank you so much. I took so many notes. I have so many questions. Um, maybe we'll start by, is it OK? Maybe we'll start by being democratic and say if anyone has any immediate questions in the audience that they'd like to ask us, you know, feel free to raise a hand now. Otherwise, I'll start asking my colleagues some questions and you're very free to jump in later. There is a mic. <laughs> we do have a roving mic. And the same goes for our online audience as well. I am keeping an eye on the comments just in case anyone wants to ask us anything at all. OK, well, maybe I'll start it off, and then we'll see where we end up from here. Um, one of the kind of overarching things I was thinking about whilst listening to each of your presentations was about this 
kind of, I guess, the title of the panel, From the Present to the Future, but then also this element of, you know, historical technological innovations, and each of us drew on, you know, older examples as well. Some of us to say, hey, maybe things haven't changed so much over the last 10, 20, 100 years. Um, but also, I think each of us has this feeling that we are maybe on the brink of big change in this field um, as technological innovation starts to grow. So I was curious to know if, if or how each of you see this moment of change. Are we about to enter this kind of new paradigm, if you like, of digital theater? Or do you think this is a slow and steady situation? I personally think that uh, we are on the threshold. And uh, on the threshold, not because of uh, the slow and steady development, which has actually has been happening, but I think the current situation in the world, in the politics or climate, we will do this uh, choice very fast instead of us. And that's why I think uh, that we are on, the, on some kind of threshold. And I think technology can help us to somehow overcome some problems that maybe we don't even imagine yet what can be. So less of a technological kind of change of threshold, but more of a the world is about to change imminently and technology can be our friend through that. Yeah, something like this. Yes, I would agree. Can you hear me? Uh, that uh, it's not only technological changes. I am not s very optimistic about uh, technology, or mm, it's. I would say this attitude. It's even boring that to be uh, very optimistic. How technology is changing all our world. I would say most recently, uh, pandemic uh, changed our world very radically. And uh, some examples what I showed were illustration for it. How. Uh, art practices are changing after changes in uh, environment or or the life or whatever in medicine and and um, so in that sense as Stavet already said uh, some ecological problems uh, political problems which are entering um, you now our everyday life and art as well they change art sometimes much more on technology. Lena, how do you feel? I do agree um, that the world changes even uh, more dramatically than technologies. Oh, technologies do change, but that we're already used to that. It's not a big deal. We know it's going to be like more and more crazy and more and more fantastic and more and more horrible. I was thinking for me, um, something I actually didn't get to in that talk, but that I found in the ETC study on digital theatre that we did last year, that a lot of theatres felt that there had been this sea change during COVID. So that study, we surveyed 17 kind of state theatres across Europe, um, asked them their thoughts, their opinions, what kind of productions they made. And a lot of them felt, I think, that COVID had been this massive moment, but that actually now the appetite for kind of digital interventions in the theatre was less than it was before because we all tried it in a terrible time. You know, no one loved the pandemic. People made some great art for sure, but you know, it was, it was rough and that digital theatre kind of had its moment and now we're on the other side, you know, thank goodness, we don't have to do that again. Um, and as for like a, a long time researcher of this field, I was kind of disappointed to see this kind of, what looked to me, this kind of peak and immediate trough. And I was wondering if the three of you have kind of seen that same uh, wave, I suppose. Yeah, it was a sad moment <laughs> to realize it. Yeah, but at the same time, for me personally, but I'm because I'm busy with it, I didn't let the my attitude or my feelings influence my optimism. Um, that I still think that, okay, we had this moment, we had the moment and it could take off. It didn't, but at, but, but at the same time, I think we learned a lot of new things. We learned also about ourselves. I learned personally a lot about myself, how, uh, for example, I don't have to go 
anywhere. I can look it from my home, and I found uh, liberation in it. In that sense, I think that maybe the, I also talked about it, but maybe the, you know, maybe Fiat is ready, and that's it, maybe the, the paradigm has, a, has another name. I would say that some social cataclysms are sometimes turning our attention to things which existed already earlier. As the same uh, possibility to communicate online. It uh, existed already decades before. We had Skype before. Some examples which, were, which I brought were made with Skype, but probably nobody is using Skype anymore. Uh, in uh, kind of conference communication, uh, people are using Zoom. But in 2020, I remember I had a class here at the academy, and half of this class was in uh, live. And then pandemic came, and we, we changed to Skype, and because there was nothing, the Zoom was somewhere away. And and um, what I want to say that uh, sometimes these kind of um, social changes or events uh, in global or local social life are kind of bringing up uh, something which uh, have been known already earlier, and and uh, I think that's sometimes um, a role and function of the artists or researchers who are in the forefront of these changes, who are uh, taking lead in some kind of uh, experimental activity in, in theatre, like uh, Tavet is doing, when it becomes kind of a normal practice, I don't know. Uh, we are waiting for the next pandemic when it uh, will become kind of normalised. As for me, I was really happy. Uh, 2021, when there was a total lockdown, uh, we had a chance to have the whole stage of the Estonian National Opera only for us for two weeks. Well, nobody knew whether the audience was going to come, but we could rehearse. <laughs> and that was really fantastic. But that was just uh, it's cynical. Uh, but in fact, I, uh, I think that uh, we've really started to appreciate liveness a lot. I know I, I felt the same, that it's so comfortable to stay at mine and never move, but uh, in fact, uh, it's... But the, uh, the real people were like, I'm telling nothing new. It's, I, I started missing it a lot, and at the theatre, everybody did. I was so fascinated um, in your talk, Lena, when you talked about kind of was it nineteenth century audiences getting screen fatigue, uh, or eighteenth? The be beginning of nineteenth. Beginning of nineteenth. Twentieth. Uh, sorry. Oh, beginning of twentieth. Nineteen twenties. Yeah. <laughs> that this kind of concept of us all being bored of looking at our screens is nothing new at all, um, and it's actually been done a hundred years ago. You know, um, I'm curious to know how they got over that, if, if you can speak to that, and if that would have anything to suggest for our kind of more optimistic idea of a third space now. I guess uh, there's a very simple answer, that the um, talking movies game, because it was at the time of the silent movies, where they had to overact the, the actors, and then, well, even the use of screens, mm, but cinema was uh, developing so fast so I think the necessity maybe uh, to, to have these projections on stage also diminished, uh, but also the quality of cinema became better. It mostly got on the nerves, as I understood, because of bad acting. But I think that uh, maybe we, or yeah, maybe we shouldn't think that uh, there are some third space or digital mediation or somewhere between physicality and reality, you know, virtual digitality and physicality, the, the theater will somehow change the existence of a physical, like hangout together. I think people want to hang out, yeah. some people. Uh, I don't want anymore, but uh, the people who want to hang out can hang out, and but at the same time, I think that the people who doesn't want to hang out, maybe 
they can meet virtually. Maybe they can find a new places where to meet. That uh, we've been thinking that um, uh, somehow the design of the internet or the usage usage the, of the internet has become really corporately controlled, and there was not any development for the. In that they will tend not that there was no development in the internet for live performances since nineties. There is no place for that. There are we have to use video conversation tools or social media. They all have like different purposes. But somehow this aspect that somebody performs live online is not developed at all. And this came out in the beginning of a pandemic. And I think it is, it, this spot will be filled mm. at a certain point. It, uh, it's going to be the billionaire who does it, who figures out how to do that, but uh, it, it will, it's not going to be empty. I can't believe it. We can see streaming, like industry at the moment, how we had at home a situation where we stream a performance and there are 20 people watching and we're happy, like, yay, we're not alone. And my son watches the video, some streamer who commented a uh, computer game with a million of other viewers in another room. So it is alive and it is working already just without us. We're not invited. When you say us, you mean theatre? Yeah. <laughs> not us, <laughs> specifically. Yeah. That was, it's really interesting to think about streaming culture. I've done quite a bit of research into the ways that those different kind of streaming platforms and video platforms, where you do get live performance online, kind of the, the set dressing, if you like, of those sites and how they change how different types of live performance is received on them. You know, like Instagram will do push notifications now. If you're already on the app and someone goes live, it will be like, hey, get over there, you know? Um, and I guess I'm wondering, do we need some more tools for our own kind of online versions of theater performances, you know? I know you were already talking about developing, you know, audience feedback mechanisms and things like this, you know, what else do we need? I guess, to make, to overcome the, the centuries old screen fatigue. <laughs> I don't know, like, I think maybe we don't have, uh, we don't have this culture yet developed. We don't know how to make uh, those artworks which are meant to be live streamed, and we don't have also any culture to watch them. We don't know how to behave. Like, we see, like, okay, I look it from my computer, it's some shit, I mean, like, I'm not interested. And that's, uh, but somehow there are, we can't distinguish like which one is good or which one is bad, or are they all bad, or um, like what are my expectations? We just don't know. I think we, this is uh, something that is developing slowly, very slowly, but it's, it does. Hi. Raivo, can we learn from participatory art or telecommunications art some skills that we would need to get better at this, do you think? Uh, yes. Uh, one important thing, actually, what I, I would like to mention, because we are talking about different streaming platforms, streaming uh, possibilities. And we are thinking that it's sort of um, no environment or programs through which we are getting access to something which is happening somewhere, some other place. But um, I think um, uh, history of um, uh, telecommunication art uh, have taught us that uh, these uh, telecommunication tools are not uh, uh, transmission tools, but they are creation tools. You can use them as a creation tools to create kind of co co communication kind of events, or um, uh, and here is the question: um, Can we uh, discuss about those events as aesthetic objects in the same way as we are discussing performances on stage? because um, they are uh, happening between different locations and their you know, place of existence is uh, defined by time. They are ephemeral. They are dying of their performance, like a theater performance is, is finished after that or next performance will be different. So I think the main question is that uh, we should um, no. Uh, understand these transmission technologies not as kind of 
uh, technology to deliver from one place to another, but technology where some creation is happening. Just before I ask you all another question, um, I just want to double check if there's anyone in the audience that would like to offer a suggestion or an idea or ask us uh, something. Yes, great. Hi, um, thanks. I wanted, I was thinking about something that um, you, Nina, said in your talk about the um, this kind of cinematic hot balloon thing and how kind of nothing's changed and now we have uh, Gustav Klimt uh, immersive stuff. And I don't know, I think, I think a lot about this whole immersive thing because it kind of, it feels like it's a new thing, but clearly it's not a new thing. But I find it very hard to think about this immersive stuff in an interesting way because I don't know, for example, I've been to some like immersive theater, like punch drunk and stuff. And it's like, it's immersive as long as you follow their rules in a way. But if you like go through the wrong door or whatever, it's kind of like this, you have to like convince yourself or like fake yourself to like be in this space for a couple of hours where you forget who you are and you forget where you are and you forget your problems and stuff. That's very cynically said. Um, <laughs> And I guess the thing that I, I like about theatre a lot of the time, like the Phantasmagoria shows, is that it only works, or like the hologram thing that you showed, is that it, it only works when you're like standing or sitting in a specific place, and it's kind of like alluding to the illusion, and like that's the beauty of it as well. Anyway, I am just wondering what you guys think about immersive stuff and now that technology is progressing and I think it's kind of going along with that. Is there interesting ways to think about it or is it just a space where we forget our worries and forget who we are for a couple of hours? <laughs> immersive stuff you're, you're using. Immer yeah, like these kind of immersive experiences, yeah, yeah, either, sure. either like in theatre or like these kind of shows. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, if, if I may. Uh, start this answering, then, um, yeah, the uh, term immersive uh, became very popular in the 90s, I remember, uh, in connection with um, in, um, interactive art, it's, uh, the artwork which kind of, where you are kind of diving in and it immerses you completely and your feels that you're, you are completely in a different world. But I would uh, remind you that uh, this kind of immersive experience is very old, uh, no, kind of uh, in our uh, human experience. Even uh, reading a book, you can, feel that you are kind of away, you are not here, you are taken away by the story or whatever. So in that sense, um, I think, uh, and, and most extreme experiences uh, I myself have uh, had, naturally this using uh, virtual reality uh, helmets or, or gloves or this kind of external devices where you really are kind of put into different environment and when you are coming out from there then you understand that you were somewhere else and certainly uh, uh, but as uh, there is a no, very old saying that uh, theater is the first uh, virtual reality uh, and uh, theater allows you also to experience that you are taken away somewhere or immersed in some other world it's uh, already probably very old uh, story. Yeah, sorry. I just wa wanted to say maybe you have had the same kind of an experience, but I uh, have seen a, a totally immersive ex a theater show. It was a Hamlet uh, with no projections at all, no goggles. It was just played out in a very um, uh, big space with several rooms and just the narration line kind of got. Uh, lost, but uh, it didn't really matter because it was such a well-known play, mm, play, and it was really fa uh, fun. You just happened to see Ophelia dying at one point somewhere, and then it really depended on where you went. But as for goggles and the, the technology, I, I'm afraid I'm a maniac for really collective arts because I never really appreciated the experience myself, I, but I love looking at people wearing goggles. And like trying to uh, just guess what are they, what the hell are they seeing? <laughs> Where are they? Yeah. I'm getting slowly enthusiastic about this mixed reality. 
and uh, to see how we could use technology to add some it's not I don't know it's not tangible it's not the right word but how could we add another layer for this reality and uh, we uh, especially I'm interested in mixed reality mm -hmm. like how I see this reality and with my classes I can have some additional parts for me it becomes a bit like shamanistic thing and I think this is also something what mankind has been eating all kind of stuff and doing it from beginning uh, but uh, this is like with uh, technological goggles we can do it maybe some bit more I don't know healthy way <laughs> I would like I don't know is it healthy no one knows yet but um explain some healthy in mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> in terms of um, ways to think about uh, these kinds of experiences um, I've done some research into the kind of, uh, not to also sound cynical, but the kind of easily reproducible versions of these shows that, um, so I live in Edinburgh, where we have the Edinburgh Fringe every summer, which is a kind of capitalist nightmare for theatre, and also a beautiful utopia, depending on how you look at it. Um, but it's, it's highly pressured in terms of the need to make money or just to survive or break even. And there has been a kind of rise in shows that are experiences for the audience but are actually automated experiences and they are immersive you sit possibly in the dark or you know in this kind of quite theatrical setting but then they shut the door and you know lighting and sound happens to you and the the action is your emotions your reaction to it you know but there isn't a performer there in that sense and it means that they can run that show 10 times a day without paying for accommodation for an actor you know and um which is genius and they're not bad shows but um, there's a lot of really great writing about this. I don't know if you're interested in reading more, but Adam Alston has written about the experience economy, um, which touches on this, and it's great. Um, and I would also recommend Josephine Machant, who's written about Punch Drunk um, and that kind of facade of agency, if you like. So, yeah, they might be interesting to you. Um, but I saw we had another hand over here. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, thank you. First of all, for this really interesting uh, discussion. And um, Tav had already a little bit jumped into this topic, what I was, I was thinking to ask uh, from you guys. is um, for, for a while now, I've been thinking what is the justification or, or the reason or aspect why to use the technology in, in or digital solutions in, in contemporary theaters, theater space or a medium. And uh, and more, what are the strengths, not only the strengths, but also new perspectives, what using technology can bring into the theaters or contemporary theater space uh, and to justify that, that like, why use this and, and why, why is this is the best medium or the technical solution for this. And, and I was thinking to make it more concrete that maybe you can uh, bring out some uh, most relevant examples or uh, in your own practice or uh, your wide uh, experience being part of this field. That feels like one for you, Tavit, no pressure. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I didn't, uh, uh, what was the question? Yeah, okay, so I, I, yeah, I know, I know, because I had a bit of this, so I was thinking like, uh, what are the, kind of new perspectives or the strengths uh, using technology in theater. What is not, like, why not use any other medium? So for example, if, if the story is maybe better told or a narrative by a book or a movie, but in our case here, it's a theater using technology. Like, why to use technology and what are the best uh, and rele most relevant examples in your case where you can see this benefit that this is exactly the only and best way. And that's why I'm using technology. For in my case, what I'm mostly interested in is, is uh, mediation, meditation, mediation, what is the right, correct word? Uh, that uh, you can do it on distant, distance. And this is for me the uh, most uh, ins inspiring part. Other, without technology, we can only imagine what's happening on the other side of the world, but thanks to technology, we can actually be there. We can uh, access it and somehow, and maybe, you know, to create a feedback loop around the, yeah, you can, oh yeah, you can do it uh, also with, uh, I don't know, shortwave radio or like a TV. I mean, it's, at in the, it's not new, it's uh, at the moment, but 
but this is like one aspect what I'm thinking. And the next aspect to use technology, at the moment I see the AI is coming. I think this will reorganize the, how we use, like especially in fiat, how we can access you know, real-time generation of uh, some content. But this is what I, I'm looking forward to. Like. Yes, I absolutely agree with um, David that uh, what concerns artificial intelligence. Uh, it's possible to create actors who are uh, sort of AI-based. You, you don't know what's going to happen with this kind of actor or projector, projections or, or, or whatever. But uh, what's interesting actually what this kind of telecommunication um, technology gives to uh, stage are um, first of all naturally to overcome the distance, uh, second uh, to avoid meeting face to face if there is a pandemic situation, and third that people are behaving uh, differently when they are uh, having output in so-called hybrid space, third space, then their no, movement is uh, related to each other movement on screen, not much in space because in space they are separated. And this is a very different situation for dancers, for instance, for some kind of professionals who are working with their body. Uh, because your no, understanding of your body and your environment is completely different and uh, you are thinking on your positions through, not uh, through the mirror, but through the, this kind of, uh, no, through the mirror, through the screen mirror, but screen is kind of different kind of mirror. It it's doesn't change parts, doesn't change left and right. This is kind of different kind of, and it influences your, you know, uh, how to say, uh, professional ability. Maybe maybe I'm not the right person to comment because it's sort of kind of dancer's topic. Maybe maybe they uh, understand it uh, quite differently. But uh, the um, um, problems of uh, proper reception are coming in here. And I think it's, um, no, it's, it's basically your ability to uh, guide your body from inside your body, that your your understanding p position of your body uh, without uh, looking where your body parts are. And so you're become, becoming much more sensitive of your uh, body uh, body behavior uh, and and uh, maybe it, it could be very practical in training as well. And so, so in that sense, uh, it's important what this technology gives uh, additionally to practices we had already before. I think for me, there's, there's no kind of must to using technology at all. Um, I don't know if I could ever make a case for, um, you know, we have to be doing this right now because it's the right thing to do for theater or, or something. But I do think that that technological curiosity has been there in theater since the very beginning. Um, you know, the, like the cranes invented to lift people up high in ancient Greek theater, you know. Um, I, I feel like there's always been that urge to put on a, a bigger and better show, so to speak, you know, that Lena touched on so perfectly. And I don't know if there's a must to use any of our new kind of toys and availabilities that we have, but I think it's natural that artists try to be curious with them, I suppose. Um, I feel like I strayed into Lena territory there, but, no, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, but I totally agree. But uh, and my very honest answer to your question is uh, is that I would uh, do anything to make a poetical illusion work on stage. So, I, but I would certainly uh, hide the uh, the media or the uh, the medium. I should say it's a weird thing in different languages. You say it differently, but I mean the machine. I would not like to know that the audience but I would I don't like them to understand what it's how it's done so a bit of a yeah but as as far as illusion producing is concerned then I'd, I'd use any technology at the same time with AI I'm quite tired of working with them because it's well it was a whole performance it was written by them and they did some improvising as well and I must say it's been like now two years but I still want to work with humans <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
we have another question just up in the middle. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, do you have any observations about the generational differences with regard to the attitude towards digital and online theater? David mentioned the game streaming stuff that is very natural for young kids to watch, and I think also all this TikTok and stuff, those are also often kind of staged, not, not like real snapshots of real life. So I'm just wondering if you if you see that the younger generations are much more uh, accepting this uh, kind of non-physical or, or online, also theater, theater plays or performances? No, <laughs> they are not, no one knows. Uh, but uh, they are not, uh, and uh, I don't, it's because of uh, age or the generation, because I think it's because of the content. I think, uh, but they also don't go to physical theater because they don't care about the medium, maybe, uh, so much. But, uh, but I think that uh, maybe there are, no, I lost, I lost the thought. Uh, then I continue when it comes back. Maybe somebody else can. Yeah. I mean, the, the thought that came to my mind was that I've seen quite a lot of, um, not necessarily screen-based, but um, bringing theatre into kind of old people's homes. And, and you know, for people that aren't able to access those spaces anymore, I think there is quite a lot of initiatives occurring to bring in older generations who aren't able to attend anymore. I've seen quite a lot of research in that field, um, which kind of counteracts that generational divide. But then I suppose you could say the fact that we need to find new forms for them suggests that they aren't naturally finding it themselves, I suppose. Have you got your thought back? I think I got it back. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it's not about uh, young people. But the thought was about uh, the people who cannot, uh, cannot go to theatre. And uh, the theatre is playing for elitism really for, for some time. But uh, what we, the uh, audience group, we got uh, the positive feedback. Actually, our young mothers who said, OK, I, I cannot go to theatre. I cannot afford 7 o'clock or anywhere. But I can watch at the performance. I can watch the performance, and the online performance. If, uh, for example, if you are in a physical performance, you are not to, you are not allowed to do anything, even not scroll the mobile phone like we had this in recently. But uh, uh, online, in online theatre, you can choose your own participation presence, I call it, or like uh, you can choose it yourself. Uh, that's so where your presence becomes a gray scale, which in physical event you don't have this option. You have to sit and stare. And so at home you can still make tea or prepare dinner and still watch like what is going on there in the theater. And this is something new. This is what we are not used to. We think that this is bad, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's actually good. Because very often I'm sitting in the theatre and actually thinking on my own thoughts and think like, yeah, then we'll, we'll this act end. Yeah, and you can also sleep in theatre. <laughs> yeah. So there is a grayscale you version have, you also. Have, but is it binary, kind of, uh, you sleep or you watch? Yeah. I'm really good at sleeping in the theatre. <laughs> One of my worst talents. Um, I was also thinking um, to ask a question on the back of your question to the others, which is, we kind of all answered then based on remote access to a performance or like screen-based theatre. But what about technology on stage in a kind of in-person production? Have you seen any kind of generational divides in that kind of setting? Um, or, you know, when you're inviting audiences to physically interact with different technologies, you know, such as sensors or VR or, or something like this? You mean spectate? Uh, you mean the audience? Yeah. Um. I, I can just say that the, um, I know that the older generation uh, gets scared if they understand that there's something uh, new and there are some new technologies involved and just don't go. Even if uh, if an opera is uh, staged in a totally avant-garde way, they won't just they won't go. And I think in uh, back about the project, what we did here with Liz Varas, a held in human, in uh, 
I know the video stream viewers, this doesn't, shit doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Behind me is a, a sto uh, the gallery of Estonian Academy of Arts. And uh, in this gallery, we did a durational performance, which lasted 24 hours, 24 for 21 days. And uh, the, it, it happened, some of it happened here, some it in virtual base, in AR layer. And there were, the communication was with QR codes. So people had to come in, scan the QR code, and activate AR a camera in their phone, and then they could access to AR layer. And that there was very clear divide between people who understand what they have to do and between people who didn't understand what they had to do. Or figure it out, uh, scan another QR code, go to web page, see the chat, figure out if I put slash imagine in front of my post, it will be uh, projected on the wall, and there was also where was divide people who figured that out the people who didn't so there was yes like very clear divide but it didn't went by age i must say it was some digital literacy i must say yeah concerning that uh, digital literacy there are uh, performances which are meant exactly for audience who are using mo mobile phones normally mobile mobile phones should be put uh, away uh, during the performances but uh, performances are made the opposite way, that you should use your uh, mobile, you are participating, you are seeing something which is happening on stage uh, via, because you are using your phone and uh, this kind of stuff. I've been, I remember we, were, um, we experienced one performance like uh, two, two years ago maybe. And uh, people were really had the opportunity to use their phones and uh, saw some elements which belong to the performance. And this is uh, also kind of solution how to um, you know, accommodate this you know, technological environment to the classical uh, mediums of theatre. That's so funny. I was going to talk about the use of phones <laughs> exactly the same. Um, I saw a production once in Edinburgh by a great theatre maker called Javad Alipur, and it was kind of about Instagram. And there was a moment in which they went live on Instagram, and we were supposed to watch the live feed with our volume up on our phones. And it made this kind of beautiful, like, laggy chorus because everyone had different internet speeds and it was kind of playing, reverberating around the space. And the amount of people that were like, shh, shh, to other people for doing exactly what they'd literally, word for word, been asked to do by the actor on stage because it just went completely against their ingrained norms it was amazing. Um, it was really fun, <laughs> actually. And I would agree that was more digital literacy and also that kind of ingrained spectatorship literacy or traditions mm -hmm. that we have that was really hard to break. Um, does anyone else have any more questions for us? I actually have a follow-up question, but <laughs> also I just wanted to mention the phone side. To, for me personally, it is actually quite important whether it is allowed to take photos and clips or not during some performance, because I, well, I, know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm used to taking them and if I know beforehand that I'm not allowed, I might decide not to go to that performance, actually. <laughs> so I don't know how common it is, but... Yeah. but that's, hmm? yep. I was going to say, that's just a, another really clear example of how important it is mm -hmm. for makers to communicate the new, the new rules, I suppose, isn't it? Or to break or reform those behaviours. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware that we're, we're kind of up to time. Does anyone have any final words, <laughs> thoughts, ideas they'd like to share? No. No, I'm out of ideas. Yeah. Out of ideas. I can quickly ask a follow-up question about yeah, all of this discussion was for, from the perspective of taking the existing theater to the digital means. But uh, what about looking at all the things that, uh, that are going on, on online and finding the theater, theatrical parts from them? I mean, as I said already, many of the uh, very popular user-created content is actually staged and in some ways theatrical. Is there some kind of, um, ca can you see theater there already in, in some different forms? I, th uh, I think it's a very valid point, very good point. Thank you for that. I think this is how it will be, to be honest. I don't think that uh, existing theater will can be squeezed in, uh, in the internet. I don't believe in this, but I really believe also in that like, uh, we find theatricality and performativity like in internet. That's what I was also, f that's what I thought and I said in my presentation that uh, what's in fear, what can we take from theater to make our uh, 
live entertainment or virtual digital entertainment that could be better and more engaging, theater is full of those uh, tips uh, because theater is very good creating a uh, you know immersive uh, immersive environment, immersive situation. And uh, I was also thinking that uh, maybe the final application won't be art at all, like in, after our research. Maybe this final application where we can use this digital performativity is actually education technology. Maybe we learn how to make proper Zoom lectures. Uh, thanks to digital theater, and uh, not it that they will not going to be performances, and our lectures will be small performances. Maybe it will, or I don't know what else. What else? Maybe it, it's another field, another domain. Uh, I'm, I'm sure these physical forms of uh, theater or visual art or whatever they stay, they will stay like forever, <laughs> maybe. But uh, the phenomenon what we can uh, follow actually in connection with new technologies, sort of kind of when new technology comes, then it's some sort of kind of peak of interest. And then this peak of interest is kind of uh, going down and the sort of kind of normalization uh, era of time starts. Uh, we, we can recall, for instance, the use of uh, video screens or video projections in theater probably in the 90s, mo most actively here in Estonia as well. Now, where they are now, it's a sort of kind of very normal technology and it's used when there is a point, not because of kind of to make uh, performance much more sexier. I think that was a really neat kind of full circle back to that difference between like novelty and shock value and the magic and poetry that Lena was talking about. And maybe we are in the kind of basin in between just now. Um, well, thank you so much for everybody for coming and your wonderful questions and for watching online. And I'm going to do a big clap for my fellow panelists. Yes? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.